Hi everyone, uh, I am Tejashri. Uh, I'm from Instacart. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about how we scaled up our machine learning models and infrastructure to handle the surge in online grocery shopping. So a bit about me, uh, I'm currently leading the machine learning team for search and discovery at Instacart. Uh, our team creates machine learning models that power core search functionality, including autocomplete. We apply and invent uh, state-of-art machine learning techniques to exciting problem areas, such as user intent understanding, neural text modeling, uh, and multi-objective ranking. Uh, Instacart, for those of you who are not familiar, is the North American leader in online grocery, offering delivery and pickup from your favorite stores in as fast as an hour. Our mission is to create a world where everyone has access to the food they love and more time to enjoy together. Coming to the topics I'll be talking about today, uh, I will start with giving you all an overview of Instacart search architecture. Then we'll cover the scale of change we experienced in 2020 and some of the challenges we encountered as a result. I will then dive into our product ranking model to uh, illustrate how our uh, like, like relatively small team overcame these challenges. Uh, finally, I'll cover some very important lessons our team learned in this process. Right, so let's get started with how things work inside our search engine. Well, uh, this is how it looks like today. It contains three important subcomponents that we typically see in most modern search engines. Query understanding, uh, retrieval, and ranking. Uh, query understanding contains ML models that focus on extracting personalized uh, understanding of user's intent. The signals from this component are used to retrieve the best matching products. We also perform semantic matching using query and product embeddings to help tackle the cold start problem. I'm going to talk about this in a bit. The retrieve products are finally passed through multiple stages of ranking before they are finally presented to the user. As I hope to convey through this talk, uh, building highly performant ML models that uh, power these components, especially for Instacart's use case, can be quite challenging. So given the focus of uh, today's talk, uh, I'd like to step back in time and talk about the state of our ML services in 2019. Uh, we started building our first ML models around August or September 2019. Uh, this is a figure that I'm sure we've all seen multiple times. It's a typical batch prediction service. Most ML models rely on, primarily on user engagement signals for training. Uh, we use Snowflake to store all search events like queries, impressions, and clicks. Product metadata that is used for additional features is also stored inside Snowflake. Uh, model training and scoring was done on Amazon ECS instances. Uh, the predictions are then written into Snowflake and ETL'd into a Postgres database. We have a Python-based service that acted as a thin wrapper to access all of the model predictions and serve them to the user. At that time, uh, given that we only had the first versions out for these models, uh, there was no established process in the team around model promotion uh, or training and so on, right? So let me switch gears a bit and talk about the effect that a uh, pandemic had on the shopping behavior on Instacart. Uh, well, to start with, uh, the number of searches exploded, uh, along with toilet paper and hand sanitizer, new users on our platform started entering a lot of novel queries that our models have not been trained on. Uh, on the other hand, as our popularity grew, several new retailers started partnering with us, which resulted in a rapid increase in the size of our catalog. Uh, well, to make things more interesting, a lot of new retailers belong to non-grocery categories like beauty and clothing. They expected highly relevant search results, uh, similar to what we see on popular e-commerce sites. Um, also our product metadata, like our product taxonomy, for example, uh, evolved rapidly with our business needs. So all of these factors uh, directly affected our ML models that heavily relied on this data. So what kind of challenges did this pose, right? So on one side, we saw a degradation in accuracy across all our models. 
uh, cold start problem became more intense. We had to deal with new queries, products, categories, users, all at once. Uh, our models could not quickly adapt to the change in distribution of search queries and product metadata. Uh, we also encountered, encountered a lot of operational challenges that uh, we, did, we honestly did not expect to see so early in our journey. Uh, like more searches and more products meant our training and scoring jobs took much longer and often failed. Uh, search ML services and the underlying databases, they had to be scaled by like a fledgling team of like, three members. Uh, and we weren't exactly experts in ML ops. Uh, all of this made uh, also made like running new experiments much harder. Uh, to illustrate my point better, uh, I'd like to take the use case of uh, how all of this impacted one of the cr most critical models in search, which is our search ranker, right? Uh, so the search ranker decides the final order of products uh, that are presented to the user. Uh, the objective that we optimize for is conversion rate. Uh, essentially, given a search query, we want to help users find products that they are most likely to add to their cart. Well, this problem is challenging because uh, the length of the search queries are often very short. So you don't have a lot of information in there. Second, uh, users enter queries that have varying level of specificities. Uh, for example, uh, they put in broad queries like lunch uh, to very specific queries, for example, like, like extra large brown eggs. Uh, I'd also look, like to mention some problems that are very unique to e-commerce search engines. Uh, so, for example, our catalog contains products from thousands of diverse set of categories, right? We also have to deal with nuances across uh, retailers. Uh, for example, the available inventory of products in shopping behavior is very different in national versus regional retailers. User tenure is also a big factor uh, since new users typically have higher expectations of relevance than more tenured users who probably know what's coming at them, right? Uh, another factor is that users tend to buy the same items again, uh, while we want our users to also discover new products in Instacart. So let's take a look at search ranking uh, in 2019. Uh, back then, our ranker model primarily depended, primarily depended on a linear combination of three signals, right? So one was the degree of text match between the query and the product name. Uh, second would be the query and product click rate. Uh, the signal ensured that popular products are shown at the top to the user. Uh, we also used the predictions of a query tagger model, uh, which ensured that the results that we show to the user are always relevant and match the user's intent. We used a very simple ranking function using uh, hand-tuned feature weights, uh, and all of this was implemented inside Elasticsearch. Right? So query product click rate uh, is one of the most important signals for the ranker. Uh, but unfortunately, we had to limit the amount of data we could store inside Elasticsearch uh, due to indexing constraints. Uh, this, has, this is not a shortcoming of Elasticsearch itself. Uh, it's probably uh, uh, just uh, uh, an outcome of how we used Elasticsearch internally, right? So yeah, uh, improvements to the quality of the click data definitely drove more conversions. Uh, but soon we hit a wall uh, due to the limited amount of data that we could, limited amount of feature data that we could index. Uh, well, we also knew that we could do much better with nonlinear features and a more complex model. So in early 2020, uh, we trained an XGBoost model and created a scoring pipeline to batch predict ranker scores for millions of query product tuples uh, to get their ranker scores. Unfortunately though, before we could productionize the setup, uh, pandemic and the surge in traffic hit us and we had to pause all modeling efforts for around three months uh, to, to put out other fires in the company. Uh, so we resumed our modeling efforts around 2020 uh, of May and tried to relaunch the model, uh, but we discovered that we had a significant drift in our data distribution. Uh, cold start problem uh, resulted in a lot of irrelevant search results, especially for new retailers uh, who expected search to play a major role to help users explore their catalog. Also, as the size of our catalog 
suddenly grew. Uh, we had a lot of new products and a lot of these lacked product attributes data that our models heavily relied on. So in order to fix these issues, we spent substantial efforts in uh, engineering features to tackle the cold start problem. We achieved this by creating features that model text similarity better so that we can show relevant results even if we had limited historical data for queries and products. Uh, unsurprisingly though, this did not completely fix the problem. Uh, like even though we saw good gains in showing highly relevant search results, uh, we realized that features based on click data were still very important for driving conversions. So to tackle this problem, we increased the frequency of update to click data features uh, in order to learn user behavior faster. We also spent efforts in feature engineering to accommodate new retailers uh, and invested in statistical techniques to reduce noise in our click data. So this turned out to be great. Uh, we drove visible improvements to search relevance. Uh, we also drove incremental conversions and basket size, which means more revenue. Uh, and most importantly for us, uh, we were able to show relevant search results from day one for new retailers. Right, so encouraged by this success uh, and inspired by companies who successfully forayed into deep learning, uh, we launched a deep learning model, uh, which improved business methods for us. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to cover the specifics or the details of the model, but we implemented a deep and wide neural network that was able to model uh, text features much better and further reduce the cold start problem. Uh, the new model drove massive improvements to all this critical business metrics uh, like revenue, retention, new user activations, and so on. So we were all very happy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, after a few months after the initial launch, we discovered that the ranking quality for certain buckets of queries slowly degraded over time. Uh, we quickly realized uh, two blind spots. We did not have monitoring to observe that our ranker score distribution was shifting over time. Our model promotion logic was not very robust. Also, Due to the increase in the scale of our data and the complexity of our features, uh, we also realized that our batch prediction system took more effort to maintain than we originally estimated. The scoring jobs, uh, for example, land for much longer and fail due to multiple reasons. Since we were relying on a batch prediction system, the size of the DB uh, database where we stored all of the predictions restricted the number of experiment variants we could run at the same time. Uh, also, all of this was maintained by only a single team member, though therefore we could not prioritize like monitoring of the scoring jobs or the model scores and so on. Uh, to add to all of these problems, we discovered many discrepancies in our uh, tracking data, and uh, therefore we had to add multiple rules to our training data generation logic uh, to work around this. Uh, all of this significantly increased the complexity of our code. So I'll now talk about the steps uh, we tackled, uh, we took to tackle these problems, right? So uh, first we started developing basic alerting and monitoring solutions uh, based on Datadog and writing custom SQL queries uh, in an analytics platform called Periscope Data. Then we worked very closely with a newly formed uh, machine learning infrastructure team in the company, and we became early adopters of the ML platform inside the company, uh, which gave us great access to tools like feature store, uh, ability to create robust training pipelines, uh, scalable serving, uh, better monitoring, and so on. Uh, all of this enabled us to quickly move away from a uh, world of batch predictions to real-time predictions. So what are some of the successful outcomes of this work, right? Uh, given the simplicity and effectiveness of our monitoring solutions, it was very quickly adopted across our team. This in turn reduced time to uncover systematic issues uh, such as regressions to our top line metrics. We also started actively evaluating uh, third party mod model monitoring solutions, uh, especially the uh, adoption of our internal ML platform uh, it helped us identify owners faster during critical incidents. 
uh, it also greatly increased developer velocity, right? So for example, extending ML services to add new models became much easier. Uh, we could also proactively measure our model complexity versus inference time. Uh, and this helped us to launch only the right sized models into production. Uh, I'll now talk about some of the important search models uh, that we work on in our team. First, uh, the query understanding service. Uh, this houses multiple uh, important ML models like uh, spelling correction, query classification, expansion, query tagging, and so on. All of this really helps us understand the user's intent much better. The semantic embeddings model uh, is also something that we are very proud of. Uh, it helps us understand latent relationships between queries, products, and user. And this helps us tackle ambiguous and very broad queries. Uh, we'll, talk about, we'll talk more about the model architecture and training methods in an upcoming paper. Well, in the realm of ranking, we are also working on using long-term user preferences as well as real-time signals to deliver a very dynamic search experience to the user. Uh, Autocomplete. Uh, Autocomplete was a revelation to us, uh, just in terms of how effective it could be you, uh, how how it could be used very effectively uh, to show uh, to shape user search behavior. Right. Uh, we're working on multi-objective ranking models uh, to show very personalized query suggestion to our users, uh, as well as maximize the number of purchases on search. Uh, all of this is especially challenging to, challenging to do uh, in a very low latency setting. Uh, apart from all of the models that I described, we also work on models that enable us to search across multiple stores, uh, recipes, and so on. Uh, finally, I will talk about some important lessons uh, our team has learned through all of this over the last two years. First, uh, invest in human evaluation data. Uh, like this data helped us understand the degradation in our relevance, uh, especially it showed us things that were not very obvious from user engagement data. Uh, we also collect this data and track relevance of our results over time. Uh, there are many ways to go about uh, doing this. Uh, we started uh, using graded relevance judgments uh, based on some internally created guidelines. Uh, ESCI is also another very popular framework for this task. Uh, second would be around tackling cold start. Uh, doing well on rare queries, uh, queries that, that typically are not very popular, uh, goes a long way in winning the user's trust. Uh, we also learned that it promotes discovery of new products, which is great for delighting our new users. Uh, tackling cold start helped us improve many long-term business metrics. I'm now going to talk about a few points that many early stage machine learnings tend to ignore. Uh, the first is obviously the, the importance of model and system monitoring. Having visibility into all important dimensions coupled with good alerting can save us all a lot of headache. Also, it's important to invest in good coding practices, uh, unit testing, integration testing, validation tests when starting up your service. All of this can greatly improve your productivity. Also, don't underestimate the power of creating a good PR process. Maintaining separate local staging production environments and keeping them all in sync is very important, uh, especially keeping the development environment production grade uh, with same code as masters, same data as production, uh, and using this platform to run integration tests, load tests, and unit tests uh, can also be very useful. Uh, another thing that we personally found very useful was building a load testing tool uh, for all of our ML services. Uh, this really helped us productionize our ML models much faster without causing embarrassing uh, production instances. Finally, creating a runbook uh, covering all common issues and important links for all your services. Uh, it goes a long way, especially in onboarding new developers onto your service, uh, helping people push codes, uh, set best practices, and so on. Um, it would be great if the template is especially common across all of the teams in the company. Uh, now I'm ready to take any questions. 
Excellent talk about a really important subject these days. Um, so does anyone have any questions? Well, I'll start with a question of my own then. So what monitoring tools did you try or what tools did your team evaluate? Uh, yeah, that's a great question actually. So the first one we are looking into is Arrives. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we started with this because our sister team uh, started looking into it and we thought it was a neat solution to have like a central centralized dashboards that can track all of all things uh, ML model related uh, for to our team in a single place. So for example, uh, uh, we have, like I just explained in the talk, we have uh, at least uh, 10 or 11 models uh, running currently in production. Uh, having this, all of this in one place, especially the features are very correlated with each other. Uh, keeping track of all of this, uh, we think would be great. Uh, also, uh, I'd also like to emphasize one point that simple monitoring went a long way. Uh, in fact, the, the solution that I talked about using Datadog uh, and Periscope data, uh, especially was also like very, very effective. Oh, awesome. Um, the next question I have is, uh, can you talk about model and pipeline artifacts for debugging rollbacks and how do you version? So yeah, so that is question. something. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's something that our um, machine learning infrastructure team is helping us on. Uh, I, I can I can go into many many details, but we are primarily relying on MLflow to help us with all of this actually. So we are building. Uh, so the team is helping us build abstractions over all of our training pipelines and so on over MLflow so that developers can just focus on creating models and model promotion processes uh, and less on worrying about the details itself about MLflow, I think so. Awesome. So a lot of questions now. Uh, so can you give an example from your use cases when you say multi-objective ranking? Sure. Uh, I'll probably talk about autocomplete. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. When it comes to autocomplete and search, there can be multiple objectives that you want to uh, serve to the user. So for example, relevance of the search results, that uh, relevance of the suggestions that, that you show to the user, uh, personalization of these suggestions, showing suggestions that are likely more to lead to higher revenue. So for example, like let's say more ads revenue and so on, right? So all these are objectives that are potentially conflicting with each other. So having a single model that can capture all of these objectives uh, is very critical uh, and something that a lot of companies invest heavily on. Uh, to, be, to be fair, we haven't done anything fancy yet. We just have several different models for each of these objectives and use a simple linear combination of these, but we are hoping to graduate into more complex models very soon. Awesome, so speaking of models, another question. So how long does it take on average to train or retrain the model or models in your case? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 uh, honestly, varies by the model. Uh, I would say an average number is eight to twelve hours. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, and so, some other questions um, people ask were: What about the visual features of the product images? Does it affect search rankings? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we believe it does. We have an intuition that it does. Uh, so one of the things we are uh, we definitely know is that uh, images play a great role in whether a user adds a, uh, a product to the cart or not. Uh, we are also exploring including product images as a part of our search embeddings model in order to increase the relevance between the user's queries and products images and so on. Uh, it, it's an interesting area that we all honestly wanted to explore more. Um, yeah, pro probably it's something that we'll definitely touch on in the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, we also have a question that is about exact uh, keyword search. So with your architecture, Instacart does not use exact keyword search according to the question. Uh, it does use exact keyword search. So we have two mm -hmm. forms of uh, retrieval. Uh, so one is the Boolean retrieval, which typically uses product metadata, like, like brand, uh, the, the brand name, the product name, the category name, and so on, and then match it with the user's query, the tokens in the user's query. We also have a semantic retrieval. Uh, we use a combination of these two, and our ranker uh, takes a union of all of this, uh, these results and gives the final ordering.